This is Unexpected with Hannah Love. In this podcast, you will gain a new perspective of how God loves you enough to call you to things that you couldn't have imagined for yourself. Today, I'm going to read a story for you guys. It's a lesser known character in the Bible, but one I love. There are a dozen lessons to learn, but a few of them are just too relatable not to share. This is the story of Gideon. Taking it back to the Old Testament, let's grab our popcorn and settle in. I'll drop a little background info to set the scene. After the great exodus from Egypt and all of the miracles throughout the life of Moses, there begins another era. This is the era of Joshua. After Moses' death, Joshua stepped in as the new leader. And not just a leader, but a warrior leader whose role was to press in and fight for the inheritance God promised his people. This inheritance was the promised land. But here's the thing about God's promises. They come with action. See, God promised to give them the land, but that didn't mean that their enemies were just going to pick up and hand it over to them. No, the blessing of a promise comes only through obedience. And obedience means action. They had to fight. I'll just pause to add that this is its own lesson if you're taking notes today. God makes promises, but it's up to us to obey, to take action, and often to fight before we see the fullness of that promise come to life. Anyway, the Israelites entered into a season of taking the land, led by Joshua, who sought God in all of his decisions. Decades went by, and the Israelites continued to conquer their enemies. And that is where we are about to pick up in our story today. So Judges 2, 8-12 through 12 recaps like this. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the territory of his inheritance, in timnah in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. That whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. And after them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the works he had done for Israel. The Israelites did what was evil in the Lord's sight. They worshipped the Baals and abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed other gods from the surrounding peoples and bowed down to them. They angered the Lord. It goes on to say that God raised up judges from among the people who saved them from marauders, but they did not listen to their judges. Years of this go by, and the cycle continues. Now, let's dive into the story of Gideon, beginning in Judges 6. Yet again, the people of Israel went back to doing evil in God's sight. God put them under the domination of Midian for seven years. Midian overpowered Israel. Because of Midian, the people of Israel made themselves hide out in caves, mountains, and forts. When Israel planted its crops, Midian and Amalek, the Easterners, would invade them, camp in their fields, and destroy their crops all the way down to Gaza. They left nothing for them to live on, neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey. Bringing their cattle and tents, they came in and took over like an invasion of locusts, and their camels past counting. They marched in and devastated the country. The people of Israel, reduced to grinding poverty by Midian, cried out to God for help. One time when the people of Israel had cried out to God because of Midian, God sent them a prophet with this message. God, the God of Israel says, I delivered you from Egypt. I freed you from a life of slavery. I rescued you from Egypt's brutality and then from every oppressor. I pushed them out of your way and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am God, your God. Don't for a minute be afraid of the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but you didn't listen to me. One day, the angel of God came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abyssalite, whose son Gideon was threshing wheat in the winepress out of sight of the Midianites. The angel of God appeared to him and said, God is with you, O mighty warrior. Gideon replied, With me, my master? If God is with us, why has all this happened? 
Where are all the miracle wonders of our parents and grandparents that they told us about? Didn't God deliver us from Egypt? The fact is, God has nothing to do with us. He has turned us over to Midian. But God faced him directly. Go in this strength that is yours. Save Israel from Midian. Haven't I just sent you? Gideon said to him, Me, my master? How and with what could I ever save Israel? Look at me. My clan's the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the runt of the litter. God said to him, I will be with you. Believe me, you'll defeat Midian as one man. Gideon said, If you're serious about this, do me a favor. Give me a sign to back up what you're telling me. Don't leave until I come back and bring you my gift, he said. I'll wait until you get back. Gideon went and prepared a young goat and a huge amount of unraised bread. He used over half a bushel of flour. He put the meat in a basket and the broth in a pot and took them back under the shade of the oak tree for the sacred meal. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and unraised bread, place them on that rock and pour the broth on them. Gideon did it. The angel of God stretched out the tip of the stick he was holding and touched the meat and the bread. Fire broke out of the rock and burned up the meat and bread while the angel of God slipped away out of sight. And Gideon knew it was the angel of God. Gideon said, Oh no, Master God, I have seen the angel of God face to face. But God reassured him, Easy now, don't panic, you won't die. Then Gideon built an altar there to God and named it God's Peace. It's still called that at Ophrah. That night this happened. God said to him, Take your father's best seven-year-old bull, the prime one. Tear down your father's ball altar and chop down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build an altar to God, your God, on the top of this hill. Take the prime bull and present it as a whole burnt offering using firewood from the Asherah pole that you cut down. Gideon selected ten men from his servants and did exactly what God had told him. But because of his family and the people in the neighborhood, he was afraid to do it openly, so he did it at night. Early in the morning, the people in town were shocked to find Baal's altar torn down. The Asherah pole beside it chopped down and the prime bull burning away on the altar that had been built. They kept asking, who did this? Questions and more questions and then the answer. Gideon, son of Joash, did it. The men of the town demanded of Joash, bring out your son, he must die. Why, he tore down the Baal altar and chopped down the Asherah tree. But Joash stood up to the crowd, pressing in on him. Are you going to fight Baal's battle for him? Are you going to save him? Anyone who takes Baal's side will be dead by morning. If Baal is a god, in fact, let him fight his own battles and defend his own altar. They nicknamed Gideon that day Jerubal because after he had torn down the Baal altar, he had said, let Baal fight his own battles. All the Midianites and Amalekites, the Easterners, got together, crossed the river, and made camp in the valley of Jezreel. God's spirit came over Gideon. He blew the ram's horn trumpet, and the Abyssalites came out, ready to follow him. He dispatched messengers all through Manasseh, calling them to battle, also to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali. They all came. Gideon said to God, If this is right, if you are using me to save Israel as you said, then look, I am placing a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If dew is on the fleece only, but the floor is dry, then I know that you will use me to save Israel as you said. That's what happened. When he got up early the next morning, he wrung out the fleece, enough dew to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, Don't be impatient with me. But let me say one more thing. I want to try another time with the fleece. But this time, let the fleece stay dry while the dew drenches the ground. God made it happen that very night. Only the fleece was dry while the ground was wet with dew. Gideon got up early the next morning, all his troops right there with him. They set up camp at Herod's spring. The camp of Midian was in the plain, north of them near the hill of Morah. God said to Gideon, You have too large an army with you. I can't turn Midian over to them like this. They'll take all the credit saying, I did it all myself. And forget about me. Make a public announcement. Anyone afraid 
Anyone who has any qualms at all may leave Mount Gilead now and go home. 22 companies headed for home. 10 companies were left. And sidebar, that's thousands. 22,000 headed for home. 10,000 stayed. God said to Gideon, There are still too many. Take them down to the stream and I'll make a final cut. When I say this one goes with you, he'll go. And when I say this one doesn't go, he won't go. So Gideon took the troops down to the stream. God said to Gideon, Everyone who laps with his tongue the way a dog laps, set on one side. And everyone who kneels to drink, drinking with his face to the water, set to the other side. Three hundred lapped with their tongues from the cupped hands. All the rest knelt to drink. God said to Gideon, I'll use the three hundred men who lap at the stream to save you and give Midian into your hands. All the rest may go home. After Gideon took all of their provisions and trumpets, he sent all the Israelites home. He took up his position with the three hundred. The camp of Midian stretched out below him in the valley. That night God told Gideon, Get up and go down to the camp. I've given it to you. If you have any doubts about going down, go down with Purah, your armor bearer. When you hear what they're saying, you will be bold and confident. He and his armor bearer, Purah, went down near the place where the sentries were posted. Midian and Amalek, all the Easterners, were spread out on the plain like a swarm of locusts, and their camels, past counting, like grains of sand on the seashore. Gideon arrived just in time to hear a man tell his friend a dream. He said, I had this dream. A loaf of barley bread tumbled into the Midianite camp. It came to the tent and hit it so hard it collapsed. The tent fell. His friend said, This has to be the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has turned Midian, the whole camp, over to him. When Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he dropped to his knees before God in prayer. Then he went back to the Israelite camp and said, Get up and get going. God has just given us the Midianite army. He divided the 300 men into three companies. He gave each man a trumpet and an empty jar with a torch in the jar. He said, Watch me and do what I do. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly what I do. When I and those with me blow the trumpets, you also all around the camp blow your trumpets and shout, For God and for Gideon. Gideon and his hundred men got to the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after the sentries had been posted. They blew the trumpets, at the same time smashing the jars they carried. All three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands, ready to blow, and shouted, A sword for God and for Gideon. They were stationed all around the camp, each man at his post. The whole Midianite camp jumped to its feet. They yelled and fled. When the three hundred blew the trumpets, God aimed each Midianite sword against his companion all over the camp. They ran for their lives. They had Midian on the run. Gideon then sent messengers through the hill country of Ephraim, urging them, Come down against Midian. Capture the fords of the Jordan at Beth Barah. So all the men of Ephraim rallied and captured the fords of Jordan at Beth Barah. There are so many lessons that we could touch on in this story of Gideon. When he encountered the angel of the Lord, he says, Stay here. Let me bring back a gift. This could easily be overlooked, but this book clearly states that the enemies had ravaged these people. They destroyed crops and cattle and any other means of sustenance. But what was Gideon's reaction? Humility. Sacrifice. He laid down what he had. 
His next act was to obey. Even in fear, he obeyed the task God set before him to do. And I think God did this for a few reasons. One, to test Gideon's obedience despite fear. And two, God will always ask us to purify ourselves and our households before elevating us to a place of leadership. Just like the priests of the Old Testament, they had to make themselves clean. Gideon was about to be thrust into a position of leadership, whether he knew it or not. He had to make ready his home. The same can be said of us today. God still asks us to make clean our heart with the prayer to purify it. Reveal the idols, tear them down, and burn what's unclean. The story is also a great reminder that God is patient with us. There's a wonderful quote by Tony Evans. You can ask God a question, but you should not question Him. Y'all, that can preach. See, God knows we are human. He knows our minds, our hearts, our thoughts. He knows our weaknesses. I also believe it's a part of His nature to want to establish that personal relationship and build our trust as a father to child. I can personally share that when God has asked me to do something and I'm hesitant to receive it, I start asking Him to confirm it, confirm that it's Him. And time and time again, He does, in ways only I would notice or ways that would only be important or meaningful to me. He does it. God knows how to talk to His kids. But there's a next step. It's obedience. Gideon asked God not once but twice to confirm what he was asking him to do. And he did it. So Gideon's response then had to be to obey. Once again, he had already obeyed God in destroying the idols of his father's house. Now God was asking him to take a bigger step. Don't you feel like we, as a church body, struggle with that today? Well, I'm just here to tell you, it's okay for us to ask God if it's really Him. There's a line I read while researching on this topic that says it like this, He will not rebuke us for having questions, but when He answers our prayers, we must demonstrate faith to believe what He says. See, God is always faithful on His end. It is up to us to have the eyes to see and the ears to hear and the hearts that recognize Him, and then It's up to us to follow through, to obey. That's exactly what Gideon did throughout the rest of the story as God called him to attack the Midianites. Through the sifting of thousands down to 300, through the night of attack and the confirmation God continued to lead him in, Gideon obeyed, and he fought, and he won. God promised Gideon obeyed, and the result was exactly what God promised it would be. Friends, Today, I pray that there is some small piece of this story that you needed to hear. I pray that whether it's a reminder to talk to God, to ask Him to speak to you, or a reminder that God can and does use those who the world calls unqualified. Today, I want to leave you with this reminder. God calls and uses and equips who He will when there is humility, sacrifice, and obedience. Victory lies behind every yes in obedience to God's calling. We may not see it in the physical, but God has already gone before us today and for the remainder of our days. He knows, and He's calling. May we all have the courage to answer with a yes, with clean hands, pure hearts, and a desire to be used for His glory. I love you guys, and I hope you have a great week. Thank you so much for listening today. If this episode has encouraged you, please feel free to share this show with your family and friends. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world today, and my hope is that this show is a candle in the dark.